Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Michael Scott and I'm talking to you today from London. And I'm joined also today by uh, Michael Collins, who's talking to us from uh, Maryland, I think. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, event in the series, Cultural Encounters, Books That Have Made a Difference. In this series, we're bringing together scholars and their audiences in order to explore themes of encounter in literary works and contemporary cultural debates. And today we welcome Dr. Molly Clark, who'll be talking on English Seneca, a vernacular rhyme and classical style in early modern English drama. Molly Clark completed her doctorate of philosophy at Merton College, Oxford, where she wrote on rhyme in Shakespeare's theatre. Her articles have been published in Studies in Philology, a review of English studies, Shakespeare and Shakespeare's survey. And she is also a reviewer uh, of early modern scholarship for the Times Literary Supplement. She has a chapter in the Christian Shakespeare question mark uh, volume, which is a monograph uh, which resulted from a previous series of talks from the Future of the Humanities Project. And she also has a chapter in the Christian literary imagination, which uh, again, uh, like Christian Shakespeare question mark, has come about through the Future of the Humanities Project. And that, and that book will be published sometime in the spring or, or summer. Uh, she, is, uh, uh, she has been working, as well as doing her research, she has been working as a part-time uh, in, in a refugee and asylum seeker, seeker charity in East London, putting her knowledge of English literature, I'm sure, to the test in a in very daunting work. And uh, we thank her for doing that. We need it in the UK at the present time. More than, more than anything else, she is a prize-winning poet, writing her poetry under the name of Mary Ann Clark. If you have any questions uh, that should occur to you during this talk, please use them in using the Q&A button, not the chat button uh, on your computer. Towards the end, Mike and I will put as many questions to Molly as possible. Please don't leave your questions till the end because that causes a bottleneck and sometimes they don't get it. Okay, looking forward to this, Molly, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, we're very happy to be here. Um, so the cultural encounter I'm going to be thinking about today is between the style of the Roman playwright Seneca and the vernacular style of English drama in the early modern period. Um, and I'm going to be looking at this cultural encounter through the lens of dramatic rhyme. And for me, this is really fascinating and really important um, because it helps us to understand the ways in which early modern English playwrights were creating a new and exciting voice for their theatre, a voice that brought together two such different and such seemingly opposed cultural predecessors. Um, Richard Helgeson's uh, chapter, Two Versions of Gothic, uh, describes the early modern sense of doubleness and self-alienation regarding the classical and the medieval. Um, he writes, by semiotic necessity, but also by a quite specific set of historical operations, the assertion of national unity arose from cultural division. And literary form is a key part of vernacular identity. Uh, I've spoken in a previous talk uh, for, this, uh, for this series about the English medieval side of rhyme's parentage uh, in the form of Tudor drama. Uh, which tended to be written entirely in rhyme. But Seneca is also a hugely important predecessor for the early modern theatre. Uh, English dramatists emulated him in the structure of their plays um, and the obsession with gory violence, for example. Um, unlike the Tudor plays, Seneca was a completely non-rhyming influence. Uh, like classical drama in general, his plays contained a variety of metres, but no rhyme. In this talk, uh, I'll be looking at how rhyme as a particularly Gothic, uh, particularly English device, was simultaneously pitted against and conversant with the Senecan. So throughout the Renaissance, uh, rhyme was strongly associated with the Romance tradition, 
uh, with medieval French and Italian as the proximate sources. Um, early modern thinkers uh, traced rhyme back to the fall of Rome and the coming of the barbarians. Um, and for this reason, rhyme is often mentioned in the same breath as barbarism. Uh, Roger Ascham refers to barbarous and rude rhyming. Um, and the aim presented in uh, Spencer and Harvey's discussions of quantitative meter is the exchanging of barbarous and bulldogdom rhymes with artificial verses. Um, and the heritage of English rhyme is indeed largely European. But there are some rhyming forms that are indigenous to the British Isles. Uh, rhyme royal, for example, is a distinctively English contribution. Um, and rhyme royal is an A, B, A, B, B, C, C rhyme scheme, uh, usually iambic pentameter. Uh, the interlocking nature of rhyme royal, alongside its historically native association, uh, arguably placed it in particular opposition to the classical tradition. And this is because uh, the more complex the rhyming stanzaic form, the more English humanists associated it with the medieval. And this was part of a sort of general animus in the European Renaissance against supposedly trivial rhyme, uh, that foregrounded formal intricacy over content. And this applied to plays as well as poetry. Um, elevated dramatic language no longer equated to varied verse form, uh, but rather to general uniformity uh, in the form of blank verse, uh, with only occasional flights of complexity. By the time that Shakespeare was writing for the theatre, dramatic rhyme could readily be associated with the vernacular, uh, the indigenous, the medieval. But these associations were anything but simple. In fact, rhyme can't be placed in clear opposition to the classical at all. So I believe uh, that in rhyme we see medieval dramatic tradition and humanist classical poetics coexisting in the early modern theatre. Sometimes they sit alongside each other, sometimes harmoniously and sometimes at odds, uh, and sometimes they become one. Um, I will argue that the enormously influential tenets of classical rhetoric, um, especially as they appear in the Roman tragedies of Seneca, uh, are in fact suited to the very nature of rhyme. Um, and I will explore the ways in which early modern audiences encountered English Senecan rhyme uh, as a mingling of two different cultural bloodlines. There's plenty of precedent for uh, this accommodating view of the two traditions. Uh, scholars as early as T.S. Eliot were able to talk of the union of Senecan with native elements to the advantage of both. Uh, more recently, there's been a critical move towards recognising the joint influence of the Gothic and the classical, or in more specific uh, cases, the morality play inspired and the Senecan. Uh, Robert Maiola um, gave a great talk in this series last week, um, and his study of Shakespeare's Senecan influence alludes throughout to the dual parentage of particular tropes. Uh, Elizabethan dramatic ghosts, for example, are both Senecan and uh, a relic of medieval De Casibus tragedy. Uh, Senecan tyrants are, uh, sorry, Shakespearean uh, tyrants um, are descended both from the Atreuses of Roman drama and from the Herods of medieval mystery plays. Um, Kent Cartwright uh, has also written on this. He says, uh, native dramaturgy can show its spirit through innovations on forms that are imported and classical. My contribution to this field uh, is to argue that rhyme is deployed in a way that embodies this intermingled heritage. Uh, though as a literary device, it stems from the Romance tradition, its characteristic features can serve the early modern dramatist as tools for classicizing. Humanist pedagogy uh, was bent on instilling a love of copious intricacy and balance. Uh, Content-based features of balance, so arguing on both sides of a question, um, were in themselves to be balanced with stylistic ele uh, elegance. Uh, paral uh, parallelism, uh, chiasmus, and repetition, generally, uh, were ways in which early moderns emulated classical rhetoric. Thomas Wilson, uh, in his Art of Rhetoric, talks about the ideal ordering of words and phrases in terms of harmony, pleasant composition, 
and apt joining together of words in such order that neither the ear shall espy any jar, nor yet shall any man uh, be dulled with overlong drawing out of a sentence. Uh, these rhetorical models were not only applied to speeches and prose, but to poetry. Uh, the early modern literary theorist George Putnam uh, calls verse more elo uh, eloquent and rhetorical than the ordinary prose, which we use in our daily talk, because it is decked and set out with all manner of fresh colours and figures. Uh, balanced arrangements, decorum and harmony are key to his instructions. Um, and indeed, he uh, devotes the entirety of English poesy's second book to proportion poetical. Um, he also gives a lot of space to forms of repetition, uh, such as anaphora, antistrophe, and epizoixis um, in the third book, uh, which he names in the Greek and then renames in English. So pattern structures were not alien then to humanist literary thought. They were one of its chief concerns. Uh, construction was hugely important to classical rhetoric and poetics, uh, to Ciceronian writing, for example, um, and consequently hugely important to humanist imitations. Uh, and construction, this idea of construction, referred to the uh, building and honing of word order and syntax uh, for maximum effect. These principles impacted on verse drama as much as on any other form. Um, Goran Stanibukovic argues that the nature of theatre in fact amplifies humanist poetics. Um, he writes, the organisation of dramatic verse can enhance the aural oral uh, effect of rhetorical figures of repetition, figures Shakespeare frequently employs in his early drama. Uh, my contention is that dramatic rhyme was co-opted into this poetics of balance uh, as a strikingly noticeable form of repetition and as a tool for connecting lines in parallels and oppositions, this Gothic device served humanism afresh as a form of native classicism. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen so you can see some slides for the next bit. Um, so I want to think now um, about the mid 16th century rhyming translations of Seneca's plays. The multi-authored Seneca, His Ten Tragedies, uh, was published in 1581, uh, but generally thought to have been written during the 60s. At this time, uh, continuous rhyme characterised English plays, both for popular and highly educated markets. Uh, let's look at how one of the translators describes his process of translating Seneca into English rhyme. Uh, he says, I removed him, i.e. Seneca, from his natural and lofty style to our corrupt and base, or as some men but untruly affirm it, most barbarous language. This is Alexander Neville in the epistle to his Oedipus in the Ten Tragedies. Uh, the introductory epistle to the whole collection uh, describes Seneca's stylistic attributes in uh, similarly laudatory terms, uh, praising his peerless sublimity and loftiness of style, his gravity of philosophical sentences, his weightiness of sappy words, and his authority of sound matter. The uh, weightiness kind of anticipates Polonius's description in Hamlet of the player's capabilities when he says, Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. So Seneca's language is simultaneously lofty and heavy, uh, where English is low without having gravity. The book contains 10 of Seneca's tragedies, uh, translated by five different authors, uh, each one uh, taking one or more plays, uh, with Jasper Haywood and John Studley contributing the most. The translations tend to be uh, generally faithful um, and extra scenes or passages added by the translators are usually declared. Though the collection is the work of many hands, there is something oddly uniform about the ten translations. Unlike their originals, they are all rendered entirely into rhyme. The standard form for speeches throughout the anthology is the long 14er couplet. Uh, almost all the translators adopt this in their scenes, um, and for their choruses, most tend to use A-B-A-B -A -B rhyming iambic pentameter or something similar. 
The oral distinction between these two forms tends to be signaled visually through typeface, with the 14er scenes in small black letter and the shorter line choruses in Roman. There are occasional divergences from these two dominant forms. Uh, for example, Haywood's Hercules Furens contains in its third act a hymn in ABAB tetrameter. Uh, his Troas contains a speech from the spirit of Achilles, uh, which is actually interpolated by Hayward and not originating in Seneca, uh, and that's in Rhyme Royal. And uh, three of the plays contain non-Senecan argument poems uh, at the start to sort of summarise the plot. Um, two of which are in Rhyme Royal and one of which is in Iambic Pentameter, ABAB. Choruses uh, seem to offer the daring translator a tempting occasion for formal ambition. Uh, Studley's Hippolytus and Hercules Oteus uh, both contain some in ABABCC stanzas. Uh, and the final one of this latter play is in a complex ABABBCBCDD uh, scheme. Uh, Haywood's Troas contains choruses in Rhyme Royal uh, and one in Octameter, uh, and the choruses in Studley's Agamemnon are in Iambic Hexameter ABAB. This changeability in rhyming verse form tries to render in English the metrical variety with which Seneca distinguishes his choruses, uh, which also, like the translations, tend to be in shorter line forms than the scene's iambic trimeter. In fact, the translators are extremely direct in the ways in which they replicate in rhyme Seneca's non-rhyming formal distinctions. Uh, discussing the translation's diverse choruses and their correspondence with Seneca. Uh, O.B. Hardison writes, if the translators had been indifferent to the latter meters of the original, they would not have bothered to create special meters for their choruses. The translator's decision to use rhyme is a symptom of their literary time, not of their insensitivity to uh, Seneca's forms. As Thomas Nash uh, famously remarked of contemporary playwrights, English Seneca read by candlelight could afford you whole hamlets, I should say handfuls of tragical speeches. So translations of the Latin playwright, English Seneca, uh, by Nash's account spawned a host of seneca English, uh, plays newly written in English, but with notably Senecan style. As it happened, this influential style did not include the 14er couplet, the form that was used most throughout the translations. What would come to be the early modern theatre's dominant form, blank verse, uh, entered into the tradition from poetry, uh, primarily Surrey's Virgil, uh, rather than from translations of Seneca. Uh, the English blank verse tragedy Gorboduc uh, was written only a year after Hayward's Thyestes. Uh, Gorboduc gave a British setting to a deliberately Senecan style of drama, a style characterised by uh, five-act structure, use of choruses and messengers, and offstage violence. Gorboduc's innovative blank verse heralded a new mode of dramatic writing, informed by humanist literary values. But I think that the association between Seneca and rhyme, and between rhyme and the classical tradition more broadly, was not destined to die out with the Fortina. The Senecan translations were using rhyme to convey the sense of their originals, working with rather than in spite of their form. So in order to replicate Seneca's weight, his pithiness, his metrical variety in choruses and his metrical uniformity in the scenes, in the English language and for readers raised in English, the translators used rhyme. Blank verse would soon triumph as the base form for Senecan style tragedy, uh, and for classically inspired drama more generally. It had replaced the Fortina as the substitution for the metrical uniformity in Seneca's non-chorus scenes. But Shakespeare and his contemporaries uh, still had cultural access to rhyme's Senecanism. And in the early modern theatre, where rhyme was no longer a baseline but special effect, they could deploy these techniques in specific and targeted ways. Rhyming Senecanisms are everywhere on the early modern stage. Uh, broadly speaking, rhyme embodies Senecan repetition and parallelism. 
but it can also function more specifically. The first and perhaps the most obvious feature is the rhyming sententia. Uh, Quintilian described classical sententiae as striking reflections such as are more especially introduced at the close of our periods. Uh, the tendency in humanist writing towards this mode of expression was partly inspired by classical authors, including Seneca, uh, whose gravity of philosophical sentences drew praise in that introductory letter to 10 tragedies. Yet, though early moderns were imitating a Senecan technique and therefore following unrhymed originals, uh, there arose a strong association between sententiae and the couplet, the rhyming couplet. Uh, Putnam cites a medieval European vogue for Neo-Latin sententiae written in rhyme. He says, whereby it came to pass that all your old proverbs and common sayings, which they would have plausible to the reader and easy to remember and bear away, were of that sort of these. In fact, uh, at a different point in his treatise, Putnam himself uh, defines sententia, um, alluding to its Latin name, but rechristening it as the sage sayer. Um, and he exemplifies it entirely through a series of English rhyming couplets. This tendency also manifested on the stage. In the early modern theatre, rhyme too was a technique employed often at the close of our periods um, in the form of scene end and speech end couplets. In combining the two, a classical feature clothed in a vernacular signifier, uh, playwrights homed in on the concept and potential of the striking reflection. Um, this practice was widespread among early modern popular dramatists. Um, John Webster's White Devil um, from 1612 uh, includes the following sententia. Glories like glowworms are far off shine bright, but looked too near have neither heat nor light. Uh, Webster seems to have been so pleased with this couplet that he actually used it again in the Duchess of Malfi in 1614. The reuse of the rhyme in a new, con uh, new context is testament to the extractable nature of sententiae. Shakespeare is evidently familiar with the technique too, as it appears in many plays in which he had a hand. Uh, Timon of Athens, for example, sports a large number of sententious couplets, such as, "'Tis pity bounty had not eyes behind, that man might ne'er be wretched for his mind," and, "'Who would not wish to be from wealth exempt, since riches point to misery and contempt?' Readers appear to have been taking notes uh, in their own private papers and commonplace books. The Dramatic Extracts project shows how frequently readers were collecting rhyming dramatic commonplaces. Uh, printed commonplace and extract collections also supplied the early modern appetite for sententiae. Uh, John Bodenham's 1600 Belvedere, for example, uh, which contains lines from contemporary drama as well as from poetry, uh, have multiple entries under a series of themes, uh, none more than two lines long. Rhyming couplets are frequent and generally distinguished by italic font, uh, with occasional exceptions. In the note to the reader at the start of the collection, uh, Bodenham explains that each theme is summarised before the commonplaces are listed. Even so, each head hath first his definition in a couplet sentence. These couplets are often rhymed, um, although the practice isn't consistent, it's noticeable enough to suggest that by 1600, Rhyme's relationship to the sententious was fully ingrained. This is backed up by the university play, The Second Return from Parnassus, in which two Cambridge students discuss Belvedere derisively, saying that it will help people to rhyme upon any occasion at a little warning. Um, early modern plays themselves were often printed with their sententiae marked um, through either a font change or marginal commas, um, or both. Less, uh, <coughs> Lesser and Stallybrass write, These printed commonplace markers seem to appear first in plays, but in the most prestigious plays in the most prestigious languages. Um, in vernacular plays, the markers were first used to commonplace translations from the classic translations from French neo-Senecan drama or closet drama by the gentry elite. But uh, following the huge popularity of collections like Belvedere, 
uh, commonplace marking in the early 17th century spread to professional vernacular stage plays. Not all of these sententiae were rhymed, but those that were were doubly or sometimes triply marked, both in print through font change and or marginal commas, and through sound. Uh, Lesser and Stallybrass discuss an example from Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida. Therefore, this maxim out of love I teach, achievement is command, ungained, beseech. Um, I'm just underlining the line there. Um, they describe the maxim as triply marked by italics, inverted commas, and the contextual run-up, um, but they don't mention the rhyme. Um, in fact, the uh, the couplet appears in a soliloquy on love and gender roles from Cressida that is entirely in rhyme. Uh, her sententious musing is marked for notice and memory just as much for the audience, orally, um, as for the reader, visually. In the same way that printed dramatic commonplaces are highlighted sometimes through inverted commas and sometimes through italics, they're also sometimes underscored in performance by rhyme, an erratic third marker. Um, I don't think I need my slides anymore, so I'll stop sharing there. Um, other rhyming Senecanisms, though less pervasive than sententious couplets, still arguably play a role in recasting classical dramatic style in the vernacular. Uh, sticker mythic exchanges in early modern drama, uh, though generally blank verse, are sometimes rhyming, um, sticker mythia being uh, when two characters speak alternate lines. In these instances of rhyming stichomythia, um, vernacular playwrights seek to emulate the pace and drive that Seneca creates with broken up lines and back and forth dialogue that contrasts with the um, great length of his solo speeches. Rhyme aids this emulation and also heightens it uh, because it sort of drives the speakers and listeners forward all the more inexorably to complete not only the shared lines, but also the cadences of the rhyme. Uh, the rhymed version of Stichomythia um, also ensures that the speakers are bound more tightly than by shared metre alone. And there's a sort of sense of knotty involution um, and the opportunity also for nuancing power dynamics by selecting whether the interlocutors rhyme with each other or only with themselves. Um, another feature in early modern drama that can be linked to Seneca is the rhyming chorus or prologue or song. Um, just as Seneca employed varied meters for his choruses, um, a variation um, that his English translators represented through rhyme scheme, um, early modern playwrights introduce formal diversity with these kinds of rhyming set pieces. Uh, passages such as the sonnet prologue spoken by the chorus in Romeo and Juliet, or the formerly varied songs in As You Like It, um, are descended from the rhyme royal and balladic forms of mid-16th century English dramas, prologues and set pieces as much as from Seneca's choruses. Um, except that, uh, unlike the Tudor interludes, these passages are not surrounded by uniform rhyme. Uh, like Seneca's chorus meters, the early modern rhyming set pieces stand out in the midst of a dramatic texture characterised by blank verse and prose. Um, and therefore they create this same sort of variety in voice and pace and style. As is so often the case, rhyme marries the two traditions. So uh, I've been thinking today about how rhyme as a particularly gothic, uh, particularly English device was simultaneously pitted against and conversant with the Senecan in the drama that was written in the wake of the 1581 rhyming translations. Uh, I've argued that uh, early modern English drama can be Senecan, even in this most uh, anti-classical feature of its style. And it's encounters like these between completely different cultural predecessors that made uh, early modern English drama so new and so vibrant in its style. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ali, for that uh, really interesting uh, account. Um, I wonder whether I can uh, start off uh, with, uh, let me just get my questions here. Uh, yeah. Is the context of rhyme 
um, a cultural encounter uh, with the English developing notion of an identity, of a national identity. What is the relationship here between, we have the Roman identity, uh, Rome and Latin, and now following the, the 1530s, you get the gradual development of an English I identity. Is it just in imitation or is it something something really that is new that's, that has got to develop and go through? Mm. Um, I think maybe a good good example here is um, Shakespeare's King John, uh, which is you know a play very much yeah. about um, national identity. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, uh, the English and, and the British kind of in opposition to the Roman in a different sense, in uh, the sense of the Pope and uh, Roman Catholicism. Um, and that's there's some very interesting things going on with with rhyme there, because that play does exemplify a lot the the kind of things I was talking about with the um, sort of English Senecan rhyme, where you've got a lot of that very sort of rhetorical, very humanist sort of um, uh, things going on in the in the speeches. But then you've also got um, the uh, character of the bastard uh, who kind of symbolises the, yeah, the kind of national identity and who kind of finishes the play on a very kind of inward looking um, desire for, yeah, England to, to itself being true. Um, and he, his speech is really, really heavily characterised by um, forms kind of similar to Rhyme Royal, so very uh, sort of ballad-like, very um, much yeah. like the speeches of sort of vice characters in um, English um, sort of mid-Tudor uh, period sort of drama. So he's giving this very, very uh, strong sense of of Englishness and of, of, yeah, kind of nationality in his, just in... The kinds of rhyme he uses but that's that's kind of coming alongside this use of rhyme as a very sort of classical very very kind of european uh bringer of sort of balance and um kind of yeah rhetorical rhetorical style so it's quite interesting i i think i think rhyme is quite a good good lens for looking at the the way in which uh cultural identity was was sort of built in in English drama in that in that period. Some uh, some uh, people will write that um, uh, that the English the English drama uh, came from uh, from the mystery cycles and the mystery cycles themselves came not as a biblical thing but from uh, from the development of the mass from the understanding of the mass as a as a kind of a drama um you know, leading from uh, from the birth and, uh, and and ministry of christ to uh, uh to a, to a climax of the consecration of uh, of of christ um uh, being crucified and then downwards uh, towards the communion um uh, uh, of christ through the resurrection so you get this kind of almost like freitag's pyramid of a of a of a of a, of a drama but of course, that was all in Latin, but it was in church Latin. And it was that that uh, uh, there was a revolt against in the in the 1530s. Was that revolt against church Latin then compensated for deliberately with, uh, with looking at classical Latin text? Mm, um, well, that makes me think of actually something I've, I've noticed that I... I kind of want to want to write on some some day, but have never never got round to before. Um, which is that there's an English, um, an interesting tendency I've noticed in in early modern drama um, for uh, uh, Roman Catholic characters uh, and particularly priests and um, didacts of various kinds to be uh, sort of um, mocked or sort of parodied using rhyme so they kind of oh. um do these quite uh quite i'm just trying to think of examples of plays i think it comes up in the um 
Peel's uh, troublesome reign of King John. Um, I think um, it's some in um, some Thomas Hayward um, plays. Does it come um, up at all with, the, with the vice figure in the in the medieval? Yeah, I, I think some of that there. Yeah, I think Marlowe's um, Doctor Faustus as well. I think there's a bit. But yeah, you kind of get the, these priests and these Roman Catholic figures saying these sort of um, quite silly sort of spells in in rhyme. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that it's quite interesting that it's mocking, uh, you know, figures that you would associate really with with Latin rather than English, but mocking them in this very English kind of way. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. What what's going on with? Um, Rome's associations there and um, yeah certainly a sense that um, again of this sort of the sort of silliness or the sort of um, arcane nature of of Latin but and you know sometimes um, you'll see uh, Roman Catholic characters in in early modern plays speaking in sort of silly Latin like made up Latin um, but quite often it's in it's actually just in English, but these the the rhyme is sort of standing in for this sense of a a sort of made up language, um, which is quite interesting. So yeah, that's a be a way of kind of being quite derisive about, um, yeah, about uh, Latin masses and, and incantations and things. But yeah, in a in a weirdly even, uh, even in, in hubble English bubble way. toil and trouble presumably yeah yeah that that yeah. kind of thing. I never thought yeah. about that in that context, actually. But no, I think yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it links in with last last week's um, yeah. talk. Let, let's uh, go to Carol Gobicki. Did the uh, the trans? Uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, Carol. Uh, did the translation of Seneca's tragedies into English play a cathartic role on the people who went to see them? If it did, what emotions were purged? or purgated that's interesting um mm -hmm. yeah i mean i suppose yeah catharsis is a is a tenet of of, of classical drama though i i mean there's i think that i mean i'm not a, a classical scholar but i think from, from what i understand there is some debate about whether seneca's dramas were actually written for the stage or whether they were mm or to be read um and i i think that that's the same thing um for the the translations i think i get the impression they were they were read they were meant for reading rather than uh, performance on stage so um it's not it's we don't get that um sense of catharsis through performance um but more i suppose one can still have catharsis through reading something but I, th I think many would argue that uh, uh you don't really experience any strong emotion other than perhaps boredom after reading the um Senecan translations they're, they're pretty dense and I think the the 14 couplets don't help I think they're it's a very 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 unwieldy form um it's come in for quite a lot of uh criticism throughout literary history um and so it's all it's very measured it's very um dense so you know it's it's yeah it's not giving a sense of kind of raw outpouring of emotion but but i mean obviously that's, that's not necessarily what catharsis is i mean they're they're very there's some very beautiful uh things and yeah obviously um a lot of uh very 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 horrible violence and i mean you know i really just read seneca in in translation but i think the bits where he's at his best are the descriptions of kind of scary and um horrible and gruesome things and yeah i think he is really brilliant in those moments and um yeah so that's um that's really if you if you're looking for that kind of catharsis then i think the translations could have could have given those for for people who who weren't able to read the Seneca in the original. Do you um, where's as far as the, the English dramatists are concerned, are they getting it uh, from uh, from reading uh, directly from reading the Latin? Uh, and has that come through 
the new school system that that, uh, that was brought in after after the Reformation? Is, is it is it the, is it the influence of the of of the schools? Do you think of the grammar mm. schools, or is it the yeah. universities? Um, I think. I mean, yeah, I think probably probably both. I think some of the translators were they were associated with universities, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's very very likely that the the school system was to thank for for yeah people's amazingly good grasp of Latin in the in the early modern period. Um, yeah, it's amazing, um, amazingly rigorous teaching of Latin. Um, obviously, yeah, that's why. They were kind of known as grammar schools because they, their whole foundation of um, of study was was on grammar, um, which is very important to to Latin. And um, so, yeah, I think the yeah, I think the translators really really were, you know, working with the the Latin originals. They were really understanding um, what they what they read. That's not to say they they don't make some things some kind of mistakes that have been spotted by uh by uh, scholars since their time um but on the whole they they seem to have a good grasp of of latin and to be directly translating it rather than working from some kind of intermediary text um so yeah. They, so yeah they're really able to bring bring that spirit to it i mean i think yeah greek was not so widely known in the period and i think that's that's partly why um you know seneca was was the was the was the big uh, classical dramatist that people people were reading in that period and less the um the greek dramatists that we would now think of as the the most important yeah it's interesting that it, 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 there a shift here that's uh, going on going back again to the reformation and the seismic encounter the, the Reformation uh, caused cultural cultural encounter. I'm not talking about particularly the religious dogma, but the huge cultural encounter uh, in the sense of education was moved from being the province of the of the monasteries uh, to the province of these new new schools, and 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 the schools and the development of the of the two universities as well as the intercourt, but. The, the the schools themselves maybe were inheriting this whole business of Latin because that's what what had been at the heart of the Roman Catholic Church was the was the Latin Bible and the Latin the Latin of the of the services, but they in, inherited that so Latin had to be taught but you needed to move it out into something that was <coughs> more secular, let us say. And that in itself was going to that encounter in itself was going to blossom through into the into the drama. Mm. Am I yeah, am that... I off I'm off piece there? But um... no, no, that's that that's interesting, isn't it? That um, while Latin was kind of fading out of people's lives in one sense, it was um, it was becoming more important in in another sense. Yeah, in in the sense of of yeah, the really really crucial infusion of of latin literature into into early modern literature yeah that's interesting i hadn't i hadn't thought about that i wonder if yeah maybe i don't know did it need to become uh, i don't know did it need to become less uh, sort of everyday feature of just something you'd hear in church in order to for people to see it in a new context i don't know well that might have been one of the consequences of um certainly at the university then of um, a distinction uh, a, a class distinction there was always a class distinction there was a class distinction between the hierarchy of the church and the and the people of the, of the church but uh, you start to get now a class distinction uh, between those who've been to the university and those who haven't been to the university which actually might might come out with out with the the, the famous um, yeah, attack on attack on Shakespeare, uh, Beauty Finding Our Feathers, you know. So mm. I just I just wonder whether there's there's something here that's that's an encounter which is definitely a cultural encounter that's going on educationally 
but is also honing in more and more on the class system or the development of the class system, uh, which England has had to suffer for centuries. Mm. Yeah, I mean, certainly the yeah Latin literature was being opened out just hugely to to so many more more people and yeah the fact that um you can not go to university and still turn out as Shakespeare you know that's it's a great a great testament to um to the school that he went to isn't it that you know he was able to write plays with so much allusion to classical literature um and so you know such an obviously strong grasp of uh rhetorical power um and you know yeah that really does come from from that education in you know the grammar school education where they were um teaching the boys sort of to um do all these exercises that were uh to develop their skills in latin but also had a very strong creative element so for example they um i think they often had to um write like a sort of element or a letter or something in the voice of a a classical heroine or uh, something like that so they were oh, um wow. doing their kind of prose composition or their yeah. verse composition to practice their latin but they were also um yeah uh practicing their creative skills as well and you know certainly uh rhetoric you know they had to um argue in on both sides of the question you know that was a, a common exercise that they they had to do which is also obviously very good for for a playwright, the kind of equivocation and the, the sort of moral ambiguity, and you know, it's important for for literary training to to see both sides and to see through other people's eyes. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a you know the fact that people, you know, so many people were able to encounter um, classical classical literature. Um, you know, the, yeah, I mean it's it kind of it shows uh, it shows in in the literature of of the early modern period doesn't it and yes a lot of of great um early modern playwrights did go to university like Marlowe and um uh, well, the Green university and, wits you know, so, yeah, yeah the university yeah. wits yeah um yeah. so but, you kind of but what, what i'm trying to get at is that you know those who went on having been at the grammar school and, but then went on to the university they started to study the Latin um, within a, a at a higher level of understanding of the poet poetry, um, but Shakespeare didn't. Shakespeare didn't go to the university, so he he can't, he'd stopped with getting all this rhetoric and understanding of the Latin rhetoric, but he'd stopped and as was criticised for not having the, being a, a university, all that authorial debate and all the rest of it. How could he have done this because he wasn't at university or he wasn't of the, of the aristocratic classes and all that, that stuff. But it may be that he'd gone to a certain level which, which would link in to a popular audience, whereas some of the others failed at that. that. Not, not Marlowe particularly, but Peel, Green, Nash, some of the others. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. I wonder if it, yeah, it just became too <laughs> went went too far in. Uh, it went too far. It became oh, too it inter was, yeah. it could have become too intellectual, which then gets a kind of a class system between the intellectual class and the quite not so intellectual class, which which results in you know all all the uh, the, the uh, Greens. Um, uh, so suppose it's probably by Nash, but uh, it also comes out as a gross worth of wit. Anyway, Carol uh, is back asking, uh, to what extent was a training in philosophical ideas required to appreciate the views presented in the plays? If it is, should we be teaching philosophy at a much earlier age? What a good question. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Molly. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um I mean, I suppose, again, a lot of people's ideas in terms of what we would now think of as philosophy probably came from literature in a way. So, I mean, yeah, we were talking about that kind of education people were getting where they had to um, think about uh, 
sort of debates on from two different sides um a lot of that was really based in in their reading of literature so they were having to yeah get into the mind of a of a character um i mean yeah i suppose um i i would i'm sure i would have <laughs> i would benefit from um from learning some philosophy um i yeah i suppose starting it from an early age is probably necessary because you know to me I've, I've never studied philosophy it seemed it would seem daunting to start it now but if it's something that starts early um, as with many things it probably becomes easier um i don't know if there was a huge amount of teaching of philosophy per se um in in shakespeare's time um and, or rather in in the time when the translations were coming out um but as i say i think they were sort of accessing some of those ideas you know seneca obviously has a lot of um yeah a lot of moral debates uh, come up in his plays and yeah those the kind of the sententiae that i was talking about earlier often have yeah were described as the sort of philosophical sentences though these kind of um philosophical maxims um and moral maxims uh people were getting that through drama and yeah through you know in many cases through the um the translations of seneca who, which were which were bringing uh those kind of philosophical ideas and debates to a wider audience yeah yeah again it goes back to this change because uh, in the in the monasteries you would have been having the philosophy and theology almost as as one you know an aquinas uh, uh for example but uh, uh being being wise widespread taught in the intellectual circles and that in itself is starting to be um in inverted commas secularized because of the uh, of the of of uh, the protestant reformers and what the protestant reformers are, are actually saying so so there's a real kind of encounter an intellectual encounter that uh, the, that is going on throughout throughout the period, uh, it seems to me, and I think that's that's what what you're looking at. But like you, I'm, I think I'm a little bit too old to get to go into philosophy now. So, uh, but you've still got you've still got time. <laughs> Carol is quite rightly um, uh, said said to me, it's Grobis. It's a soft C in her name. So, so thanks thanks for the, for that, uh, uh, Carol. If Carol, that's a Carol female, or or a Carol male, I'm not too I'm not too sure. It's with a K. Anyway, that's. Uh, I wanted to finally ask, uh, how do you how do you think Shakespeare consciously used um, this as a strategic device in his drama? Um. So I think. Um... In so many of his plays, you'll see um, a lot of this very um, kind of classical use of rhyme as this kind of closure to a scene, closure to a speech. Um, uh, a lot of sententiae, rhyming, uh, rhyming sententiae, um, and yeah, it's often bringing sort of uh, balance and parallelism and things like that. Um, but you also see uh, that. Uh, coming sort of in opposition to much more uh, kind of unruly forms of rhyme, like um, in uh, Titus Andronicus, for example, obviously a yeah kind of Roman setting, um, and throughout kind of the first four acts, um, you've got yeah rhyme only coming up occasionally as a sort of in a sententi sententia or in a um, kind of rhetorical flourish or whatever. But then suddenly in the fifth act, when it's all kind of kicking and you've got the human pie being eaten and uh, people stabbing each other all in quick succession in revenge, avenging each other and whatnot, um, there's suddenly this really weird um, pickup in rhyme where it's all pretty much constant rhyming couplets. Um, so you've got this, in, in a very Senecan play, like a play that even directly quotes from uh, Seneca, actually, um, you've suddenly got this a very undecorous kind of unsenecan um explosion of rhyme in a kind of demotic way so he's kind of um 
it's like he's he's kind of using the Senecanism of Rome, but then he's uh, yeah he's just using it in a new way. He's kind of bringing that violence on stage, which was which was off stage in Seneca, and he's he's bringing it in in this kind of very thrusting sort of um, uh, very in your face kind of way. So it's it's really interesting that he's using this the Senecan rhyme but he's also doing something different with it and making it this very uh very vivid vivid kind of vibrant thing yes thanks for that it's a really kind of interesting interesting subject right the way through there do you think there's any difference between the way he does it and marlow of course marlow dies in the 30th of may 1592 do you, do you think do you think marlow does it at all Always. Yeah, I mean, I think Marlow very much uses the kind of um, the the classical sort, the classical rhyme or the, the Senecan rhyme. Um, he's obviously famous for uh, for his blank verse and for kind of being against rhyme. Like um, the yeah, he talks in the introduction to Tamburlaine about the the jigging veins of rhyming mother wits, whatever you know. Quite yeah, he's, he's seen as anti rhyme. Uh, which you know he isn't he does use it um effectively uh, one thing marlow does a lot actually which is very striking when you're reading marlow for the first time is um the device i think it's called epistrophe where he uses the same word at the end of successive lines yes, um, yes. it's like um uh shall all we offer to xenocrity and then myself to fair xenocrity you know it sounds more yes. weird because it's just the same word at the end he does it particularly with sort of exotic or interesting words why does rhyme disappear uh well i would say it doesn't become an alphabetic poetic <laughs> i would say it doesn't disappear it just uh it goes into becomes a special effect rather than a kind of continuous thing it's still it's still there it lessens a lot because of the supremacy of blank verse but it's it's still there yeah that's what i'd say <laughs> okay. where's the thing well, when the cats are conscious of the king <laughs> Very good. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks to you, Molly, for such a stimulating paper. You've got got me thinking here, and uh, I'm sure other members of the audience. And uh, thanks to those members of the audience who've uh, who've sent in questions. Um, I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will join us for the event on the 12th of February to hear uh, Professor Michael Collins talking about James Joyce's The Dead, a terrific. Uh, novella really so we uh we look forward to that on the 12th of february same time we've got an interesting talk in our free speech at the international crossroads coming up on wednesday february the 14th when we'll be asking how the world might change uh during the course of this year with so many important and unpredictable elections that are going to take place half the world it seems is going to go to the polls this year, uh, one way or another. Will it be? In, uh, will we be in a very different place this time next year? Um, I'd like to thank uh, Georgetown University for supporting the series, especially President Jack DeJoy and Vice President of Global Affairs Tom Banshaw. Thanks also to Julia Miller and Mary Gordon, and my thanks to Mike Collins, who behind the scenes helps in a great deal. I'd also like to thank at Blackfriars Hall, John O'Connor, the Regent, and Richard Finn, the Director of the Las Casas Institute, and uh, their UK Administrator, King Arona Gabnai. And uh, my thanks uh, to Maggie Scott, my wife, uh, at Oxford Scott Education for the help that she gives in developing all of these and, and running these uh, sessions. I'm Mike Scott. I'm a Senior Fellow and Senior Dean at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. You can follow me on LinkedIn at Professor Michael Scott and on Facebook as Michael Kerr Scott. Till next time, thank you very much. And again, Molly, thank you very much for a stimulating paper. Bye-bye.